Hi all, this is an example of an application of linear function. So it's a word problem involving a linear function. I'm looking at this on my screen and realizing I didn't up the font for you, so I'm sorry that this is little. Uh, in general, a lot of my examples are at the beginning of your packet, especially word problems. So feel free to go snag the linear functions packet if you're having a hard time reading any of this. I will try to make sure that I increase my font for videos in the future so it's a little easier to see. Okay, so maybe I'll rewrite some of this a little bit bigger. In this problem, we're given an equation, and it is a linear equation. So here's my function, <clears throat> um, otherwise known as your model. I'm peeking here to see if I use that vocab in this problem, and I did. So if you are modeling a real-world situation, in this case, we're modeling the relationship between the depth D of snow in feet and the maximum speed of a snowplow S in miles per hour. So we're modeling that relationship. The equation or graph or table, whatever that models that relationship can be called your model. So I'm not trying to be tricky if I say anything about model. I just mean the equation or graph or table that you're working with. Okay, so usually the trickier part of word problems is when you're not given the equation and you have to go find it, but I want to start off with one where we have it and we're just trying to interpret some different information. What do things mean? All right, first question, if the plow can only go 20 miles per hour, how deep is the snow? So hopefully this one is an easy one to get us going. We're being given a value of one of our two variables, either our input or our output, and we should be able to find the value of the other variable. So the value we're given is this 20 miles per hour. This is a value of our output variable, the speed of the plow. To be really clear, when I replace my output variable with 20, it's this entire thing. The S and the D are not multiplied. They're attached. This entire chunk represents output. So we're going to have 20 equals negative 5 halves D plus 30. And we need to solve for D. Since there's only one D on one side of the equation, this is going to be get rid of everything attached to B using reverse order of operations. So if I were to plug in a D, the first thing I would do is multiply by negative 5 halves. The last thing I would do uh, would be to add 30, which means the first thing I should get rid of is the 30. It's attached by addition, so I'm going to get rid of it by subtracting. 20 minus 30 is negative 10. Okay, the next thing I need to do is get rid of the negative 5 halves. Negative 5 halves is uh, attached by multiplication, so the appropriate way to get rid of it would be to divide by negative 5 halves, but hopefully we're good enough with our fractions to realize that dividing by a fraction is exactly the same as multiplying by its reciprocal, so I'm actually going to sneak this step in and show it to make sure everybody's really clear. We're going to multiply both sides by negative 2 fifths. So again, I'm thinking I need to divide by negative 5 halves. To divide by a fraction, you flip and multiply. So I'm going to multiply both sides by negative 2 fifths. I'm getting a little squashed here. But let's see, we can do some simplification here. The negative signs are going to cancel out. And then we can go ahead and simplify this up front. If this is a 10 over 1, we can cancel a 5 out. And it looks like we're left with 2 times 2, which is 4. Okay, so to give our answer, 4 is great, we need to include units, and I didn't leave myself much room, so I'm just going to rewrite this. If the plow can only go 20 miles per hour, if that's its maximum speed, then the snow must be 4 feet deep. Again, units are really important on these. That's how I can tell that you went back and thought about what your answer meant. And it's really important to me that you think about what your answer meant and if it seems like a reasonable answer to the question. So for example here, I would be bothered if I got a negative depth of snow. That's definitely unreasonable. If I got something like 500 feet, that sounds pretty crazy to me. So you should be doing that just really broad reasonableness check. It's nothing perfect, but it should help you catch really crazy answers and fix them. Okay, part B, we are supposed to interpret the slope of the model. So we need to be able to identify the slope for starters. Hopefully that's easy here. We were given the equation. 
If the equation is negative 5 halves d plus 30, then the slope is this coefficient on the variable, negative 5 halves. So the slope is negative 5 halves. Or if you'd like, you can rewrite that as negative 2.5. My general rule is anytime you're working on a word problem, it's completely acceptable for me for you to turn things into decibels, if that makes them a little easier to make sense of. If you're just working on a problem that does not have an application, a word problem attached to it, please give me exact answers. Don't ever convert to a decimal and round. But always okay to do that for a word problem. I'm not expecting a model to be 100% perfect anyway, so if you get a little rounding error along the way, I wouldn't be worried about it. Okay, so we're supposed to interpret our slope. We've done a little interpret average rate of change, so hopefully this won't seem too bad after that. I do this a ton. It's really important that you figure out which variables on which axis. So speeds are going on the vertical axis and depths are going on the horizontal axis. I can tell because if s is a function of d, then we want to make our graph look like s depends on d. Which means over here I have change in y, which for us is speeds, over change in x, which for us is depths. So this says to me, if the speed of the, oh, I'm sorry, if the depth of the snow, let me get them in the right order, increases by one foot, the maximum speed of the plow should decrease by two and a half miles per hour. That's a great slope interpretation. So let me write it down and then I'll point out the really key parts. If the depth of the snow increases by one foot the max speed of the plow will decrease by 2.5 miles per hour. Okay, so there's several things that I look for in a slope interpretation. So you want to make sure you're really careful. The slopes and average rates of change are the pickiest ones. So make sure you're really clear on what you need. One is there should always be numerical values with units. So the one foot, two and a half miles per hour. I'm going to go looking for that right away. Uh, it would be completely legitimate to keep that written as uh, negative five over two in which case you would have something like if the depth of the snow increases by two feet, then the maximum speed will decrease by five miles per hour, which is equivalent and completely fine with me. Um, the other thing I'm looking for is slope is a rate of change. And if it is not worded as a rate of change, then I don't know that you fully understand what that means. So the fact that I have words that show that the depth is increasing and the speed is decreasing is really important. I'm going to look for those words that show me that this is a rate of change. The last one can be a little bit subtle, but if you just read your statement back to yourself, it should be easy to catch if this isn't making sense. We've said that the speed depends on the depth. If your wording is wrong, it will sound like the opposite is true, and I want you to try and avoid that. So sometimes I'll see something like, if the speed of the plow decreases by two and a half miles per hour, then the depth of the snow will increase by one foot. And it's not terrible, but I don't love the dependence there. It's making the dependence sound backwards. It's making it sound like the um, plow going slower is causing the snow to get deeper. So sometimes that doesn't matter in a problem. But if you're reading through a problem and the way you've interpreted it makes it sound a little awkward, you might have something wrong. So just try and make these things as clear and reasonable as possible. Okay. Uh, next part, I'm thinking I didn't leave myself quite enough room for this one, but let's see. We want to find and interpret both intercepts of the model. Interpret, I see I'm switching back and forth a little on vocab. When I say interpret, I mean the exact same thing as when I say explain using everyday language. So if ever on a test you get directions like that and you're not completely clear on what I mean, that is a totally reasonable thing to ask me a question about. Okay, so one of our intercepts we get for free. The other one we'll have to do just a little bit of work to find. So I know that my vertical intercept, and I'm not trying to be tricky using that more complicated vocab, but here, since I'm not using y as a variable, it's not really fair to call that a y-intercept. 
but it is easy enough to say this is my S intercept, or if you want to be a little more general and not attach yourself to a letter, you can just say it's my vertical intercept. That's where I cross the vertical axis. This interpreting means that when the depth of the snow is zero feet, the plow can go a maximum of 30 miles per hour. Uh, sometimes I'll have people here just want to say the, the overall maximum speed of the plow is 30 miles per hour, and that's true, but I'm really looking for that understanding that an intercept has two coordinates. So I would do the little bit of extra writing to tell me that you know that the zero is zero feet. So if there is no snow, the max speed of the plow is 30 miles per hour. Okay, we'll see if we can squeeze these in the little spot I gave myself. I don't have the horizontal intercept where we cross the horizontal axis for free, but I can do it with just a little bit of work. So let's see here. I'm going to sneak this off to the side. If I would like to find the horizontal intercept ever, it doesn't matter if this is a linear equation or a quadratic equation or what kind of equation or function you're working with. If you want to find a horizontal intercept, you're always going to let whatever variable is your y variable equal zero. The same idea holds for finding the vertical intercept. If you're trying to find a y intercept, you'll always always let whatever your x variable is be zero. So in this case, that's why we get it for free. If I let d be zero, I get s equals 30. Without doing much work, I can see that. If I let s be zero, I can find the d value where we cross uh, the d axis. Okay, so let's see. I am going to go ahead and subtract 30, right? Reverse order of operations. And then once again, we want to get rid of a negative uh, five halves. It's attached by multiplication, so we'll divide, which means we'll get negative two fifths times 30. And just like before, we can do a little bit of that canceling up front. We can cancel a five out, and that will leave us with two times six. Hold on, I lost a minus sign somewhere. There we go. The minus signs will also cancel, so we're getting positive 12. We were looking for an intercept, so remember this is a point. D is 12 when S is 0, and when you interpret, you need to make sure you mention both of those values. So this is telling me that if the snow is 12 feet deep, the maximum speed of the plow is zero miles per hour. So I would simplify that statement a little and say when the snow is 12 feet deep, the plow can't move. If the snow is 12 feet deep, the plow can't move. Okay, um, <clears throat> I'm trying to think if there's anything else I want to mention on that one. I don't think so. I think that about covers it for that part. And there's a little more to talk about that will go with the very last part. So the last thing we're supposed to do here is sketch the graph over a reasonable domain. Okay, so reasonable domain. We know that domain is the set of all possible inputs. If I say reasonable domain, what I'm looking for there is just not what is it possible to plug into this equation, it's what makes sense. What will give you an input-output pair that actually has some real-world meaning. So if I start thinking about this, here, let me go back up here instead of drawing, I have four quadrants to think about, and sometimes you can just straight up eliminate quadrants. So a good place to start is to ask yourself which quadrants actually make sense. So this is really just asking yourself if positives and negatives make sense. So quadrants one and four have positive uh, D values. D is the depth of snow. Two and three have negative D values. I don't think negative depth of snow makes sense, so I think we can eliminate two and three right away. 
thinking about S values, quadrant one is going to give us positive S values. This is maximum speed of the plow. Quadrant four is gonna give us negative S values. Again, I don't think it makes sense to have negative S values. So I'm gonna say in this problem, I really only wanna see quadrant one. It is not always going to be just quadrant one that you look at, so you need to make sure you think about this for every individual problem. Do positive, negative make sense? Is there some biggest value that makes sense? So on. So I've narrowed it down somewhat. When you're drawing me a graph, you should always very carefully label your variables, either write out in words what's on that variable or, uh, sorry, what's on that axis, or use your variables to label what's on that axis. Uh, you'll also want to give me some sort of numerical scale so I know how big your tick marks are and how much of the graph I'm looking at. So we'll do that as we go here. I just want to think a little about the information that I have. What I know right now is that I have a y-intercept, an s-intercept, at 0, 30, and then I have a negative slope. So I'm going to start at 0, 30, and my y-values are going to decrease from there. So I think that it's pretty safe for me to put 0, 30 towards the top of my graph. Okay, so I'm just going to go ahead and put in a little bit of scale. My tick marks are going to be 10 units apart. Uh, from here, I know I can go over to down five, or I can kind of jump past some of that information and say, well, I already found my horizontal intercept. It's at 12, zero. So if we put that 12, zero right there, what I'm getting is that my graph should decrease from 0, 30 down to 12, zero. And I'm not showing this cross through and have arrows on the end because I'm only supposed to be showing the reasonable domain. So I do not want to see anything that goes outside of quadrant one. Let's go ahead and say this is three, six, nine. There we go. So again, give me a little bit of scale. I'll label one or two tick marks for me so I know how big your scale is. And then always label your axes either by writing out in words or using a variable to show me what goes on each axis. Um, okay, let's see. I think I'm actually going to get into writing down the reasonable domain here. It's not asked for, but it's a great thing to talk about. We can draw the graph over a reasonable domain, or we can just say what a reasonable domain and even range are. So in this case, the reasonable domain ended up only being d values between 0 and 12. So there's a couple of ways to write this, and I will be happy with either one. Uh, one is you can use an inequality. You can say 0 is less than or equal to d is less than or equal to 12. This sort of compound inequality, the sandwich statement, should only be used if you're trying to say between. So if it makes sense to say that the d's should be between 0 and 12, then sandwich it. If it doesn't make sense to say between 0 and 12, then you shouldn't be using the sandwich. I would be completely happy with just an inequality like this. If you want to be a little bit more formal, you can use set notation, which just looks like tacking a little bit on. So the squiggly brackets mean the set of. So this is the set of all d's, and the vertical bar means such that. So I would read this as the set of all d's such that 0 less than or equal to d less than or equal to 12. Uh, I like the inequality notation. I think it's really clear and doesn't give us much room for getting confused with some other notations. But it's also totally valid to use interval notation. Interval notation here would use the exact same values starting at 0, stopping at 12. But it leaves out all this middle inequality stuff. And it only uses that. I start at 0, I stop at 12. This in the middle, it just looks like a line, but it's a comma. So you always need to work your way smallest to largest, smallest value, largest value. And then you choose the brackets to line up with whether or not you're including equals or not including. So whenever you want to say less than or equal to, greater than or equal to, you should use a square bracket. If you do not want the equal to, you didn't want to include 0 or 12, you would use a round bracket. We can also give a reasonable range here. 
Your domain and range have to go together, so you can't just restrict the domain down to what makes sense for the domain and the range down to what makes sense for the range. They have to be a pair. So looking at my picture, I've chosen this little chunk in quadrant one, which means I have Ds between zero and 12, and I have Ss between zero and 30. So again, if you wanna use set notation, I'm fine with just the inequality, but you'd start off with this set of all S such that, and then we wanna say zero less than or equal to S less than or equal to 30. And if you would rather use interval notation, you would say, I want my S values to start at zero and stop at 30. Once again here, I'm using square brackets for both because I want to include both zero and 30. So you do not have to use both. This is an either or statement as is here. So choose one, use it correctly. I don't care which one. You should understand both so that if I ever write, oh, sorry guys, I'm seeing that I went off the page. If I ever write something uh, in either form, you understand what it means. All right, thanks for watching.